Welcome to part three of the step-by-step -step cassowary video. This is the final part, so we're going to show you how to finish off this cassowary artwork that we've been working on. If you haven't already, make sure that you tune into part one and two so that you can see how we got up to this particular step. So just continuing with my Xtech 200 airbrush and using a sepia brown by Trident, I'm just finishing off some of these feathery areas using the dagger strokes, similar to what we did um, in the other areas in part two, so towards the end of part two. So make sure that you check that out. You can see that I'm doing these dagger strokes, but I'm not just coloring in that whole area. I'm gradually getting darker and leaving some lighter sections out as well. Just mapping that in. Now these ones are slightly blurrier at the back. The reason for that is that we want them to be not as prominent as the focal piece, which is the uh, the um, head and the main part of the body of the cassowary. These are uh, part of his sort of feathers at the back, so behind him, so we keep them a bit blurrier, so that way it starts to bring that 3D element into it. Same with the background, that will be um, blurry as well, so that way it, it looks like you're creating all this depth, all right, just by changing the way you paint with the airbrush. So you probably noticed there I used a um, bit of the paper template that we cut. So that one was made out of the photo paper. So I just used that, held it on like a freehand template. So if you um, print your artwork out to scale, then you can utilize, you can do usually multiple prints and utilize them as freehand templates. Um, and just utilize them through the whole artwork. So you can, you know, cut out highlights or the outside of the um, shape of whatever you're painting and just hold it on there like you would a normal freehand template and then render from there. And then that'll give you those sharp edges. And if you want to create more of a blurry edge, then you actually lift the template off the surface and then that will create a softer um, edge. Okay, so depending on what look you're going for. So the colour I'm using now to further detail this area of that bluish tone that we've been rendering under the beak area on the neck of the uh, cassowary. So the colour that I'm using at the moment is a, a mixed violet. So this is um, Trident's Violet and mixed with uh, Reducer and a little bit of transparent base as well just to make it a bit more transparent and um, just to give me a little bit more control over it. So play around with the mix, um, totally up to you how you mix it, how much of you know transparent base you want to put in, if you want it to be um, extended out further and make it more even more transparent than what I'm using, then by all means you can add more transparent base. Uh, reducer, just add as much as you prefer, so similar to any of your other mixes, and then adjust your paint flow accordingly. So generally, if I over thin my paint, which I do do quite a bit, then I will run at about 15 to 20 PSI. If I'm um, trying to get quick coverage or I'm doing larger areas or I'm just using the paint pretty much one to one mix or straight out of the bottle, I'll increase my um, air pressure to about 30 to 40 PSI. Um, that way it'll just ensure that the paint sprays out nicely. So just spraying that uh, violet over certain areas of the uh, cassowary where it's darker. Now because it's nice and transparent I'm not eliminating all of the work that I've put in uh, underneath but I can also continue to coat over the top of it to create darker shadows. Keep in mind to control your overspray you don't want to get it onto all the other areas that um, where the violet might look a bit funny, especially just where I was in that area underneath um, near that bottom section of the beak there where that yellow and orange is. Uh, you don't want to get too much overspray in that section, so try and control it. And again, um, as I mentioned in the other two parts of this video, be sure to follow your reference as accurately as possible. 
Now we're working again with the eraser pencil. So I'm using the harsher edge to scratch out some uh, more definite highlights. You can see I've freshly sharpened that and when you sharpen it try not to create too much of a point. You can see it's got like a bit of a um, angled sort of uh, point on that. Kind of like a chiseled point if you will. And that just gives me a bit more control. If it's too if it's too pointy, what'll happen is it just sort of moves around. There's too much movement in the eraser, and um, it just doesn't let you control it. So I'm just moving around on this top section here, trying to create these real harsh highlights, and adding all the little bits of detail in as well. Remembering that if I um, if I want to leave it this bright, that's fine. But if any areas are too bright, I can always work back over the top with my colours. So this will still shine through underneath, providing you don't um, coat over the top of it with an opaque colour. Take your time to be a um, accurate with your highlights as well. So remember your light source plays an important part so you, you want to try and follow your reference and make it consistent. And just carefully removing those highlights. You'll notice on this area here where there's not a lot of um, paint I'm going to start using the pink side of it of this particular eraser pencil which is the softer tip that will just give me a little bit more control and it's not as aggressive just working in the beak area now flipping back to the uh, harsher end which will quickly remove my paint and in most cases go straight back to the white of the aluminium composite panel. A little bit out of shot there, so apologies for that. But pretty much repeating the same um, type of technique. We're just looking at the reference and replicating all the highlights adding in as much texture as possible but again not um, try not to go overboard so it's only only getting highlighted where it's actually needs to be highlighted so these are some of the areas that you missed but I'll give you another demo on how that's done so again with the eraser pencil we're just removing um, some of that paint there which is creating more of those feathery highlights now these are very very harsh highlights so we'll blend back over them we're using this mix here do another pre-mixed color Grab our freehand template again, we're just going to layer that on the artwork that we've completed to create a positive mask because we're going to spray in the negative area. So whenever we say negative mask, that means we're spraying in the positive area. So if, for instance, a negative mask would mask off the background of this and then we would paint the cassowary's face. But in this particular point, we're putting down a positive mask, so we're masking off our positive area and we're going to spray the background right so we're protecting our artwork so just try and line it up as best as you can now you can make that brown up with numerous different colors um, I would have added a bit of flesh tone to that 
um, some of their oxide paints. So just have a play around with it. There's no real rules to this background. So I'm leaving it pretty free to, if you are going to attempt this artwork, just make it up as you go. I did change the background totally from the original reference. So yeah, like I said, feel free to make your own version whatever you prefer. Now to spray this background I'm, I've switched back to my X-Tech 300 with the 0.3mm needle. So this is just giving me a bit more coverage, a bit quicker coverage, but I've still got plenty of control. And you can see I'm just checking my areas and making sure that this template that we cut earlier is reasonably accurate some of it of the areas I'm just going to spray in freehand so you don't need to totally rely on your template for the whole um, spraying of the background but it definitely helps to keep that area clean you can see I've just taped it at the top there so that it allows me to flip it up and down just to keep checking and that way I'm not um, jeopardizing the movement and positioning of where that template's sitting. So now I'm moving to a, a pre-mixed green. It's a reasonably bright green there, which is nice. So that's blending well with that brownie color that we sprayed first. We don't want a lot of detail in this background. It just wants to be a mottly background. We really want the illusion of that cassowary to make, like, by doing the background um, blurry and not that detailed, will allow that cassowary to really stand out. So you can see I've just um, added some moss green uh, from Createx Illustration Colors. I've put that into the airbrush and I'm spraying that over. Now you can see how it's reasonably bright moss green. Even in the bottle, it's it's very very dark and muddy looking, but the more that you coat it, the more the colour will come out. So you can see how transparent it is straight out of the bottle. So it's a really good colour. It's almost like your sepia, you know, you sort of start off and it, it's, it's not super duper dark, but you can keep coating it and coating it and coating it. Same with the moss green. You can really notice how much of a variation I'm getting. This is still moss green. So just with that one colour, it gives you a lot of control. So we're just mottling that in, make it look like it's sort of bushes in the background or some, some sort of greenery. And this would be sepia brown mixed with a bit of black. mixing up some reducer in there. I'm actually using the Trident reducer for this even though these are Createx illustration colors. Um, everything's really compatible and I really do in, I like using the Trident um, reducer. I think it flows really nicely. So I'm just going to add a bit of sepia brown. So you can see how thin I make the colour and then a few drops of black. Give that a stir. have it a bit darker so we'll just add some more black it's always a good idea that if you are going to add black to a color add less to start off with um, and check your mix because it's a lot easier to go darker you can always add more black but it's very very difficult if you've gone too dark to rescue the color okay so a lot of the time if, if we're mixing up a color and we want to go darker, I always make it a bit lighter. I can always add more to it. All right, so keep that in mind. 
So now we've got our sepia mixed with black and we're just going to again fog that in. Not up really close. Again, we want a blurry-ish sort of background because we want the illusion that this is way off in the distance and that cassowary is right up in front on their painting. Okay, so by blurring the background, that's going to lift the foreground and the foreground being the cassowary. So you can see it's it's covering and getting darker a lot quicker now that we've added that black into it. You can see already there how much it's it's making the cassowary pop. And now it's also showing us that we still need to render the cassowary a bit darker. You can really notice that certain areas are, are still quite light and that's because we've now eliminated the white background. So your eye isn't looking at that white background anymore. We've got a darker background so that's telling us that okay the foreground needs to darken up a bit and we yeah we haven't finished the cassowary yet. So still a bit more work to do but that's fine. We'll just get straight back into it. just darkened that uh, mix off again just the one that we used in the background and we're going to start to do our final render with that black slash sepia mix you can see that's a nice nice tone we've got there it's not too dark it's um, still got plenty of sepia in there so if we shade some areas we're not the black isn't going to kill our existing color sometimes black well a lot of the time black can just be way too harsh so i tend to mix it in with other colors that way you darken off the original tone you still get coverage and you still have control to go darker without um, compromising the color and making the whole picture look flat because there's too much black in there. It's very very rare that I would use a solid black to render anything. It's always mixed in with another color just to take the edge off the black. So still working in those dagger strokes just to build up all that feathery area. controlling this dark tone being careful to leave spots that need to stay lighter so that we don't just flatten those areas that we've spent time building up so you can also see that the um, the highlights are still there this they're, they're still slightly visible even though we've eliminated probably 70 to 80 percent of them but that's sort of what I was talking about with that 5 to 10% that you actually see makes all the difference. So blending all this in, darkening it all off, popping that next section forward, being careful not to go too sharp with these areas. You can see we've got a bit of a masking edge there so I'm just eliminating that. One thing as well, you, I mean, you notice that that uh, masking has created that slight edge, which is, look, that's going to happen in paintings. You are going to get an edge if you mask it up, but it's always a good idea to leave the final detailing uh, to the step after you've done all your masking, because what will happen is if you just mask it and leave it and call it done, it'll look a bit like a sticker. It'll have a real harsh edge, whereas if you sort of do it the second or third step before you finish then what will happen is that you come in with your final tone and you work back over that your foreground um, is usually the last thing that you should be doing so therefore the overspray sort of eliminates that harsh edge and gives you the, the, the illusion that it's more realistic so I'm just Detailing all these areas with that darker tone. Gradually building all the shadows. Running some of those fine dagger strokes as well. Again, over the top of some of the background. 
which means that again it's bringing that image forward fixing that area up there it was a bit needed to come out a bit further with those feathery sections keeping a nice crisp edge where it needs to be again using my 0.2 mil needle in this XTEC 200 it's allowing me to get some nice fine details and to really control these dagger strokes you can also notice how I'm reworking certain areas so I'm coming back and, and darkening over an area um, so I'm not just trying to get it to a certain point first step straight off the bat I'm coming back looking at it checking my reference okay I can go a bit darker and by doing this this just avoids me overdoing it because um, as I mentioned earlier that if you do it lightly and build it up you're always better if you do it too dark it's very hard to remove the paint and you don't want to have to go painting over sections so just take your time working in some of the background there as well now we're going to really start to bring this color into the rest of the cassowary starting with this uh, bony section on the cassowary's head and we're going to run some of these stray sort of hairs coming off as well these have just got to be real nice tight dagger strokes nice and controlled if you're not confident doing them freehand off the side of the image you could go back to your paper mask mask off what you've done and then run them off there and that'll give you a nice crisp edge but I wanted them uh, a bit more of a natural look just taking, taking my time here just to get nice little tapers and do some of these ones as well while I'm at it again up nice and close and it's virtually just a tiny dagger stroke so you kind of move into the stroke and taper it off a few more on the side of the head there of the cassowary again follow your reference don't just cover it with these little hairs you want to pick and choose where you're going to put them and remember to also not have them all running in the, the perfect direction nature is, is a bit erratic it's very rare that every single strand is going to be perfectly lined up so if you want to get a more photorealistic look then that's definitely what you need to be doing keep it a bit more um, I suppose unbalanced Just taking my time again checking my reference getting in as much detail as possible especially now being the final tone I want to make sure that I um, only paint all the areas that need to be darker I don't want to compromise all the work that I've done by just coating back over everything and making it uh, appear flat I'm going to get my Michael Valley true fire template it's amazing that these you know you can pretty much grab these templates and there's so many that come in the set but um, you, you'd be amazed that how many shapes they actually fit it's almost like they've been designed to fit every single artwork so you can see here I found an edge that fits really nicely for that area under the beak so I'm just carefully holding that template in place while I um, get that nice sharp edge this will give me the illusion of 
again to bring that beak forward and there's that severe drop shadow underneath. So don't be afraid to use a, a template or mask something up if it's necessary. So if you do want to get an absolute crisp edge, even if you're the best airbrush artist and you, you've got amazing airbrush control, it's, it's impossible to get as sharp of an edge freehand as you would with a template. So you can see how much that's lifted that up and brought that um, lower part of the beak forward. So we're really starting to get some dimension now into this artwork. Working back over some of the areas that we've attacked earlier. Now we're going to keep adding detail with this tone. You can see I've got the air pressed all the way down and I'm only slightly moving that trigger finger back because I want to control the amount of paint that's coming out as I'm up so close to the panel. I don't want to risk spidering out the paint. So I'm very, very careful at this stage only to add that tone in wherever you need it. Now even though this isn't a solid black mix, it's mixed with the sepia and some reducer, so it's um, a little bit more forgiving, but if you're not confident with it being this dark, then add another tone before this, so mix it up sort of at half of this strength, do all the dark renderings, get the feel for it, you know, practice all the strokes and then come in and do it darker again. It's always a good idea to mix up a you know a lighter one and add a couple of extra tones if you're not 100% confident with your um, ability with the airbrush. So you can see I'm doing a combination of real sharp shadows and some even some dot sort of shadows in there, some random sort of dots, and then blending out from those sharper areas and feathering down but a lot of the time it's the stuff that you leave out that makes it look the most impressive so you, you know you might shade in a corner and then slightly blend out so you're moving away from the surface a little bit and then what's happening is you, your eyes completing the artwork because you've already pre-done the other areas with those um, previous tones so then you're getting that nice gradation so again that's the idea of this black uh, mixed with sepia. You don't want to just go over everything. You can see I'm leaving a lot of it out so you, essentially you're painting less with this. You're always with the darker color you always paint less but it can take just as long because you've got to be really really careful because it's a crucial tone. And you can definitely easily overdo it. So just this is the time when you really need to focus on that reference. Just moving around a bit, building up my textures, but extremely carefully, some real sharp shadows where I'm confident they have to go, which is also creating some real fine creases in this sort of area under the uh, beak and, and the neck of the cassowary. I'm holding the airbrush with both hands at the moment. If you want to rest on the image, you can also um, put on a glove on the, the other opposite hand that you're using. So not the one that you're pulling the trigger back with, but the opposite hand. That way you can rest on the surface without the risk of contaminating the, um, the panel. I'm not too concerned about this particular artwork because I'm only going to put a... Um, pressure pack can clear over it just to seal it. It's an archival clear that you use on canvases and everything and it's like non-yellowing and everything so it's perfect matte finish just to seal the artwork and seal the panel. I'm not going to two pack clear this one so I'm not too concerned about if I'm touching the panel a little bit here and there. 
So I've got a brighter green now, as you saw earlier, another pre-mixed color. And what I'm going to do is just um, bring out some of this background. So I'm just going to brighten it up a little bit. I'm just finding it's a little bit too dark. So spraying over some of the darker areas just to lift the uh, lift this greenery out again. You can see how bright it is, but it's not covering well enough. So what I'm going to do now is just add a bit of white, just to give it a bit more opacity. A little bit more green again. And then I'm going to stir that with a uh, icy pole stick. Give that a good stir just to mix that in. Check the color. Pretty happy with that. Now we're going to just brighten up some of these areas. So it should give us enough coverage now. You can see how much brighter that is now and how much quicker we're getting coverage. So that's good. That's what we want. And again, we're not, we're not going super detailed. We just want to bring out, punch those colors out a little bit more. That's all. And just take your time. You can see I'm just gradually building the opacity, not trying to get it in one hit. starting to pop it out a bit more which is nice again I can just leave that mask there for the time being if I need to adjust the background as I go so I'm going to pull out a little bit of detail now just to pick up on the edges of that those shrubs or the greenery whatever it is Be careful not to get overspray on what you've already done. If you're unsure or you're not confident, flip the mask back down like this. So you can see, just to get into those corners there, I don't want to risk it freehand. So and I'm also being nice and careful not to over go over all those little fine hairs that we put in earlier. But I'm starting to get happier with that. We're switching back to a moss green. Dust back over the top, so we'll flip that positive mask back down. This will take that pastelliness out of what we've just done with that opaque green. So this will the moss green will just put a bit more body back into it but we've in, in turn brightened everything up because we've got a brighter base that we're working over now. So it might take a few layers playing around with it to get a background that you're happy with. Just 
starting to come to life now. The background's definitely helping. So come back in with the XTEC 200 with our darker sepia slash black mix. Just carefully darkening off the uh, right hand side of the image. Again, come in, make sure that the template doesn't flutter up with the air, so that's why I use my, my finger there to hold it down. Always a good idea with uh, freehand templates. If you want to stick them down um, temporarily, you can also use spray adhesive. Lightly spray the back until it goes, it goes sort of a bit tacky and then you can stick it down but just be careful of where and what you're sticking it on as the glue can react but that can also help just to hold things into position but generally I just use my fingers works really well and I mean again freehand templates are, are pretty much more just to get an outline and then you can freehand off that so they're not designed to spray heavily through and then that's your artwork. So I'm pretty happy with that background. I think that's, I'd say that's pretty much complete. So we'll, we can remove that positive template now, that paper template, and we can go back to rendering in that uh, neck area of the cassowary once we finish off on these side feathers. Again, a bit out of shot there, so apologies for that. I think you'll get the idea of uh, what we're doing. We we'll just continue to render. Build up your textures. We're attacking all the extreme shadows and detail. Even those little fine folds, we're doing some dot highlights again. And we're bringing that uh, blue area into that fluoro red area that we did earlier. So we, we're sort of, with these shadows working on top, that'll, in a sense, merge the two colors so it looks like it's all part of the one painting. So you kind of do your color blends first and then bring your shadows and your highlights over the top. Again, building everything slowly, making sure we don't just coat over everything that we've done. Just being very cautious. Again, up nice and close. Keep that air on, just pulling back a little bit on that trigger finger. So you really gotta be careful because you're working so close now that um, you don't wanna pull back too far and then spider it all out. You can make a serious big mess on this. Just shaping it bit by bit. Again, bringing my shadows in over the top and into those uh, blends of the two colors.
Starting to detail a bit under the eye there. So you can see even though that um, sepia brown that we used earlier is reasonably dark, you can see how much more contrast you're getting now with this sepia mixed with black and how that's just layering nicely and it's um, building so much more depth that we've added that colour in. It almost makes the previous sepia look a bit pastely now and a bit washed out. It's kind of like we're pulling the whole picture into focus with this darker tone. Be careful under this beak section. Again, you don't want to get any overspray and you don't want to compromise that nice sharp edge that we created using that freehand template earlier. So if this is the first time that you've uh, seen one of our videos or you've visited our channel, welcome. If you're a, a subscriber already, thanks for joining us again for another video. We really appreciate your support. If you are new to the channel and you do like what you see, we do many more step-by-steps. We generally do uh, live streams every week. We do airbrush insight videos, um, showcase, as well as... Um, all sorts of other airbrush related things, new products, you know, anything virtually airbrush related. Um, and we're all about helping to inspire you and your artwork. So if this is something that interests you, we would love to have you join our community. So feel free to uh, hit subscribe. There'll be some, uh, there'll be a link at the end of this video. Um, or you can just uh, jump on the channel page and, and hit subscribe there and tap on the bell icon to be notified when we release new content. So we do hope that you enjoy this particular video and feel free to check out all of our other videos. We've got well over 100 now, so it'd be great to have you join us. So just use that... Uh, Freehand template again, just to get that sharper edge in that beak area there with that shadow. A couple more little stray hairs on the bottom of the beak. Putting them in freehand, but very carefully. Staying nice and close and keeping the airbrush under control here to add in all these details without blasting out too much paint, risking a run or a spidery section. So just uh, ever so slightly pulling back on that trigger but kind of moving with it at the same time. If you um, want to practice your freehand techniques as well, sometimes aluminium composite panels, um, well, they, they're not sometimes, but they are actually quite difficult to work on because they're um, non-porous, they're completely smooth surface. So when we uh, teach our students, especially with the uh, beginners class, we do a t-shirt. So even though you can't do scratching techniques and um, eraser techniques on a t-shirt it's a hell of a lot more forgiving and um, they're great fun to paint so I always recommend anyone that's new to airbrushing or wants to polish up on their freehand skills then definitely uh, have a go at a t-shirt just draw up an artwork and you know follow your lines color it in do your shadows your highlights 
the good thing about a shirt as well is you, you're sort of forced to do um, real even coatings when you're even colouring in a section um, because it will show up if you don't do a correct 50-50 overlap and um, and with your line work as well to follow a, a grey lead line on a t-shirt is quite a challenge to keep that nice and even but it's so much fun to do it so I'd highly recommend that you know whether or not you go buy a cheap t-shirt or a few of them and, and draw them up and have a go or if you uh, go to one of your your local shops that sells t-shirt material and buy it you know it in a few meters and just draw up a heap of artworks so I highly highly recommend it it will definitely improve your airbrushing skill even more so than practicing on paper So again up really close around these areas taking my time making sure that I get all of the detail in so many different textures and you know sort of almost stippling uh, techniques and everything required to get this beak looking somewhat realistic again picking out some of those real fine shadows again dot shadows in here Essentially, we're just rendering it to make it look more uneven so that it's not just a smooth um, beak, you know, you don't want it to look totally flat. And we're gradually shading as we go. Trying to leave the highlights where they need to be, but also using this as an opportunity to darken them off a little bit more if something is too bright we can um, use this color and just gradually knock it back. So just take the edge off it. So but you can see how close I am and how carefully I am rendering this entire area. You know, even though it's a real small part of the painting, um, as accurate as you can be is always best. It's just going to make it appear so much more realistic if you have all these little variances in your painting. Just doing some real fine dagger strokes again for these little stray fine hairs that are uh, folding over this beak section try to keep your airbrush moving like I'm doing there so that you don't create a blob at the start of your uh, dagger stroke again if you're unsure I do have a separate video that um, shows you how to create dagger strokes so be sure to check that out just darkening off some of these shadows so up nice and close to continue getting some of those definite shadows in there around the eye section you can notice that some of the blends are smooth but then others I'm pulling back and forth on the uh, trigger finger to create a more of a stippled sort of uneven shadow so depending on what area I'm um, shading that will determine how I'm going to attack that particular shadow 
I'm getting a bit of tip drying there so just blasted that out and you can see there with my trigger finger doing more of a dot sort of multiple dots like back and forth back and forth to create those little tight dot shadows Again, a few more through here on this beak section. And I'm varying my height with my airbrush as I go so that I get um, softer dot shadows and more defined dot shadows. So by having a bit of a mixture that you know makes it look a bit more realistic as well. Now doing a few more little dagger strokes to create those little hairs. Taking my time to get in all the detail and all the shading in the right spots. So keep looking back at your reference. Try to remain as accurate as possible. It is going to take a bit of time, so be patient. And remember, just try not to overdo it. Just moving around, getting shading in all those areas. You can see it's really coming to life now, that darker tone's really bringing out all the detail. Bit further away from the surface on these shadows, just to get a softer blend. Remember, it's easier to control your shading, especially when it's a dark color if you're further away from the surface all right so but if you are going to do that make sure that the overspray will only affect the area that you're spraying in so you don't want to do this with the risk of um, the overspray blending into another color so you notice that when I was further away from the surface then I was working on the center part of that beak section where the overspray would just blend into either side it's nowhere near the blue section or you know any other areas that could um, contaminate my previous colouring. So just working back over some areas that I've already done earlier. So this is pretty common, I'll sort of jump back and forth if you've seen some of my other videos or artworks that I've completed. It's uh, a, generally a way I work, I sort of move right around the painting, it kind of keeps it interesting and um, you sort of look back at a section that way as well so you're not just focused it's I mean it is good to focus on one area and try and get that finished but sometimes you need to give your eyes a rest move to another spot get that all or, or pretty much done and then you can move back and check back over what you've done previously it's amazing what you'll pick up if you do that So now we're just going to work on that eye, so nice and um, close, just to get this pupil darker. Trying to stay away from some of those highlights, unless they need to be in shadow so I may dust over some of them now if if that's necessary if not then they'll remain as bright as they are
taking my time to get all this detail in there so I'm not just flattening all the, the detail that I've already added I'm just um, adding more depth to those details to bring them out nice and sharp around the perimeter of the eye if you're uh, not confident doing this freehand you could get a template as well or go back to your original um, printout and if you did make one on the photo paper and you could cut out the eye carefully and use that as your freehand template that way that will give you the exact shape and um, the size will be accurate as well adding a few more up close textures again it's all about the little things so take your time and add them all in you can see I'm careful not to eliminate all of that blue Adding more and more detail, some more dagger strokes and cross hatching in that area. Same thing, dagger strokes in there and coming up nice and sharp in this area here. To really pull out that detail blending out on this area above the eye again I softened a little bit of the blue but it's still shining through so not eliminating all of it Some of these real tight dagger strokes for these lashes. Just make sure you shut the paint off as you taper it down through the stroke so that you don't get a blob at the end you don't want a, a heavier section at the end you want them to taper nicely it's just practice so don't be disheartened because as I said earlier dagger strokes are one of the hardest things to master Again, just more dagger strokes. And shading back over some of this blue area. Some more little imperfections. Just getting all that detail in around the eye. So really zoom in on your reference, especially if it's on an iPad or a tablet that you can um, zoom in or on a screen, whatever you're using for your reference. Really uh, zoom right into that reference so you can make out all the detail. and literally just paint what you see more 
more shadows just to build up this area, make it a bit darker. So pretty happy with the way that's coming along so far. So just be careful, don't overwork it either. Remember less is more, you can always add to it. So if you're unsure about a section and you think, oh, I'm going too heavy, then maybe leave that section, work on another part and then come back to it later and have a look. Adding a bit more detail to the tip of the beak here. A few more shadows blending out. A few graduated tones there. Still leaving that highlight as well, so not eliminating all of that. Just further shaping it. Adding a few more stray hairs there on the side of the cassowary's head. Again, just little tight dagger strokes tapering them off with a couple that are crisscrossed so they're not all pointing in the same direction. So as I mentioned earlier, you want it to be a bit erratic. You don't want to follow every single hair in the same shape and everything. So Making, making them a bit uneven is going to help the realism of it. Just starting to bring some more detail into this bone section. Few dot shadows up close and blending away so we get a nice uneven texture. You can see that trigger finger going back and forth, back and forth, keeping the air on all the time. A few more dots. So really varying the texture in this area. Remember if you're dotting, um, adding dot shadows into an area, the tighter you keep those dot shadows, the uh, more that area will darken. So if you leave gaps in between them, then that area will be a bit lighter. So the shadow effectively will become lighter. Working back over some of those eraser sections to knock them back a bit so they're not as harsh. So even though they were put in earlier, this is where you can blow back over the top of them and um, yeah, just come back and fix them all up. You don't have to worry about them being too bright. Again, working back over some of the textures that we've added earlier. A 
adding some more shadows from a distance as well as unevenness right the way through softening a few more of those highlights So really a combination now of being up close for some of the real tight shadows and further away to dust in over the top of areas, especially spots where I want to let the detail from the underlying tone shine through. Really starting to shape this artwork. Moving back in, knocking back some of the highlights in the eye there. Only really subtly, but just making it match up a bit more to the reference. Dusting back over the top and then re-erasing. So this is a good way to reactivate the paint. So if it has dried off a little bit and you want to get a uh, brighter highlight back out, then you can work back over it, dust over the existing colour, and then while it's wet, erase, and it'll take it almost right back to the uh, previous tone. Now we're just adding in some shadow down the bottom there. Just bringing some detail and shading over this bright area that we did with that fluoro red earlier. Again you can see how this dark mix just blends really nicely over those bright colours. So you can shade nicely onto it without eliminating everything. which is important, you don't want to kill your colours, you want them still to be able to pop, so majority of the way I paint with any coloured image is I'll always do the colours really, really bright, and then I can soften them down with the shadows later on. So that way it's, it gives me that really bright colour, um, even when you're shading over the top, you've got that brightness that's still there. So now using that eraser pencil again, just pulling out a few more highlights, switching to the harsh end to pull out those definite highlights on the edge of that beak. So these will be pretty bright. Don't be afraid to go reasonably aggressive where the highlight is, if it is there and it is bright, then um, by all means replicate that. Don't think that oh, it's got to be softer. You know, just go by your reference. So you can see I'm really picking out some bright white highlights in certain areas, but I'm not just going over everything that I've done. So being selective of where I'm highlighting, keeping in mind my light source, where it's coming from, the shape of what I'm highlighting as well as you know what the beak would look like and appear to look like
So we're just going to add in a bit of grey. Just a few little grey highlights here and there. On these uh, feathery sections. And then we can work back into them if they come up and they look a bit too bright we can always knock them back a bit later this will just add a bit of uh, dimension to these feathery sections we just got some extra highlights on there just to create a bit more depth Again, they look way too stark when you first do them, but then we'll soften them back off with uh, some of that dark mix that we're using. But it definitely helps to create a bit more shape to this image, especially those feathery areas there, which were looking a bit too flat. You can see by coating over it a few times, it's going to get brighter and brighter. It's going to become a lighter grey, so even just using that one mix of grey, you can really get a nice variation. And for this particular colour, I'm using the X-Tech 300 by Segola with the 0.3mm needle. So you can see that's now that by putting that grey in, we've got a lot more body to those feathery areas. Just adding a bit of that grey in on the top section there. Bit of a, a muddy sort of highlight, which is not usually what you would do, but it's kind of the look that we're going for to replicate the, uh, the tone accurately. This sort of bony, or you know, bony sort of, uh, what would you call it, horn-like thing on its head has numerous different layers and uh, tones, as you, as you know if you've been watching all three parts of this video. And... Um, you know you kind of muddy it up with one tone and then knock it back with another just like we did then so we've put the gray on there which is kind of what we would call muddied it up you know it's an opaque color over some transparency and then now we're bringing in that uh, that sepia black mix that final tone that we've been using and that just takes the edge off it and knocks it down a little bit but all these layers are helping the realism so we're now back in this uh, feathery area and like I explained earlier that the grey is a bit too punchy so now we're working that back in with this sepia black mix that we've done and we're really just adding in a bit more texture again and defining our um, shadows and you just leave the bits that you want to remain lightly grey so you can see how I'm eliminating quite a lot of it but still leaving a portion so that you still got that greyish tone and the highlight but essentially you still got all the layers there so it's a great way to get that effect so even if you go too heavy with one tone you can come back in um, and render it and make it a bit more accurate with the darker tone Same thing on the uh, rear feathers here, on the back of the cassowary. Again, these aren't as sharp. We want them a bit blurrier, so it looks like that's 
sitting behind the head and the neck area. Dusting back over that just to soften the grey again. But that layer has definitely helped to give that area a lot more depth. I've just added burnt sienna into the airbrush there. I'm just going to dust over and work in some more detail into these sections just to um, add a bit more tonal value in there. Pull out some of those markings. Now, because this is a transparent colour, it's not going to eliminate anything that we've done earlier. Just adding a blend on top of it. Using the same tone in there and then also in this uh, fluoro red section just to tone it down a little bit, give it some unevenness. Dusting a little bit of that burnt sienna in the background, just in the lighter areas there. Give it more of an earthy tone. And now we've got some bright yellow. Which is going to brighten up some of these yellow sections under the beak area. So because the pigments are pretty bright, you don't need a lot. Just make sure that when you are using this yellow, it's a transparent yellow. So you don't eliminate what you've already done. see so you don't need a lot it just really does add a bit of that yellow hue to certain areas now we're using some white so even though we've done a lot of the highlights using the eraser pencil I just want to come in and add some bright white highlights with this opaque white by Trident just in certain areas only. So I don't want to go overboard, I just want to pick out um, some of those real bright highlights and just to build up on some of these um, textured areas by adding a bit more airbrush into it after you've done a lot of the eraser techniques and blending and shading if you do some of the white highlights with the airbrush it's just a nice um, added extra and because you're using all these different techniques it gives you a lot more depth and um, realism again using white you want to be careful not to over spray onto your darker areas and eliminate where your shading is. If you do happen to do that, then that's fine. You can come back in with your darker tone and clean that up a little bit. But um, if, you, if you're careful enough with this, you can notice that I've put the white in the uh, X-Tech 200 with the 0.2mm needle in it so that that way 
it um, it's a bit more controlled, especially for doing all these fine highlights. It will tip dry a little bit more because it's in this particular airbrush, but I did add quite a bit of reducer into it. So a lot of the time if I'm doing real fine, fine stuff like this using white, I'll reduce my paint, you know, to say 30% paint to 70% reducer, and I'll drop the pressure down to about 15 or 20 PSI. If you are using an airbrush with the MAC valve on the front, a lot of the old water airbrushes have those, then um, you can adjust the pressure from the front of your airbrush um, and you can drop the pressure even lower than that. So what you do is you leave the pressure as it is through the compressor and then just adjust the pressure from the front. Um, you can also purchase inline MAC valves as well. So that way if your airbrush doesn't have one, you can essentially uh, add one to it by installing one of these inline MAC valves which means that it's actually on the airline and you can adjust it then. It doesn't work, it works similar but it's not as effective as the built-in MAC valves on the, uh, on the front of the airbrush. But this particular airbrush will do nice and fine detail. You just got to make sure you get your paint mix right because it is a finer needle. So you can see even just little bits of white highlights there is making quite a bit of difference. Again, build your white. It takes time to get full coverage and you'll notice it will be more prominent on the darker areas. So we're just getting some nice bright white highlights in certain areas just to pick out a bit more detail. Keeping the air on all the time and just carefully pulling back on that trigger finger being very very cautious not to go back too far so that we get a big blob of paint on there we do not want to be doing that at this stage of the painting a few highlights on the beak area so I'm virtually just looking at my reference again and just having a look where this white would be suitable without overdoing it. It's very, very easy to get carried away with white. So just really be careful with it and take your time. Even have a short break and then come back and have another look at it to see if you've gone too much. Um, or if you've gone too little you can always add more but try not to go overboard with the white because it's going to be a nightmare to try and eliminate it all so again just carefully adding a few more highlights here and there even brightening up some of those real white sections so even though they're quite bright already a little bit of highlight over the top of a shaded area will still shine through a bit of white added to the background as well you can see how cautious I am not to go too sharp we still want that background to be reasonably blurry to create that sense of depth. And there we have it, the completed cassowary artwork. So what we're going to do now is unmask it, so unmask the border. We are going to start by removing some of this excess masking tape. So whenever you remove tape from 
virtually anything. Try and um, be careful when you when you take it off, so you don't. Obviously, these are stuck onto bits of masking tape already, but it's always a good idea and a good habit to get into to pull back on almost a 180 degree angle. So I'm just trying to split the tape here to remove the um, masking tape first and then leave the fine line tape still stuck down like that and then we'll remove the fine line tape last so that we can really pull that fine line tape back on a 180 degree angle so it's it's essentially almost cutting the paint that way um, there's no chance of the paint bridging and when I say bridging that means the paint sticks to the tape and that's when you can tear the sections of the tape especially if you've got bad adhesion um, or a contaminant or something then sometimes the paint will stick to the tape and lift off as a big chunk or something like that so you don't want to do that so it's always a good idea to pull back on a 180 degree angle so you'll notice now you can see I'm pulling back 180 degree and kind of away from the surface so I'm essentially using the tape to cut back along that paint edge. That gives me a nice clean mask. So we want to remove all of this, which is giving us a nice frame like border. Now with this particular artwork, I just sprayed it with a um, uh, basically a clear coat that um, is an interior clear so you can use whatever you like two pack clear intercoat clear whatever you feel fit this is just a display piece uh, for our shop front so it wasn't going to be outdoors or anything like that if it was I would definitely use a two pack clear either matte or glossy to seal this off depending on what look you're going for but um, for this one I just used a art shop aerosol clear which is like a matte varnish so I just used that sprayed that over the top and that's worked really nicely to flatten it off and that I did once I'd unmasked everything so I haven't at this stage I haven't cleared it at all so just make sure you remove all the masking tape also make sure your fingers are clean when you're doing this you don't want to get dirty fingerprints or paint marks on the uh, clean white edge that you've got there so just take your time you can see there's a bit of a section there where the paints bled through so I'll fix that up I'll just use a cotton bud and a bit of Windex and remove that because it's a water-based paint the uh, window cleaner with ammonia will remove that really easily And there you have it, the completed cassowary artwork. We do hope that you've enjoyed and you've learnt a lot from this three-part step-by-step tutorial video. Until next time, we hope that we've inspired you to create some more amazing art and appreciate you tuning in for this particular step-by-step. -step. Until next time, Feel free to check out any of our other videos and thanks again for watching. We do really appreciate it. In the meantime, if you haven't already, feel free to hit subscribe. We have plenty of step-by-step -step tutorials, quick tips, airbrush insights, showcase, live streams and much more. You can also visit our website at airbrushasylum.com.au. Thanks for watching.